Okay, so I want to talk about some changes being made to market at 7. Um, I'm not sure if these will bubble down um, in the link data tools format. Um, I think they will, um, because I don't think many people are probably editing this file yet. Um, so um, the way that the tool works, so MarkEdit has a, a linked identifier tool. This is how you can build, um, do reconciliation work and create subfield zeros and ones and fours within your um, bibliographic records. And the way that this works is it uses a, a, a rules file. And the rules file was created specifically so that I could create rules files for, say, Unimark or other flavors of Mark and not tie it directly to Mark 21. Um, doing that has some um, means that there are some challenges. Um, so right now, uh, the rules file, if you want to edit, edit it, is an XML file. So XML file is basically this one right here. So the XML file has two parts. There's a rules file, um, which defines how MarkEdit reads specific Mark tags, and then how it does reconciliation against those tags. Um, and then a collections file, which defines the collections that MarkEdit is aware of and determines how to um, uh, use those collections to generate um, uh, request um, for uh, reconciliation purposes. So there are a couple different ways that uh, people have set up services to do this kind of work. So one of them here, as you can see, is the Library of Congress. So the Library of Congress's name authority file does not use a Sparkle query. Um, and I've created a special um, statement uh, in the um, RDF code uh, library, the, the linked data uh, platform, to accommodate the way the Library of Congress's um, ID.gov works right now. So there are a couple of different ways it works. Um, but the one that uh, is preferred um, does essentially a headers query um, against the service um, and then returns back just a header, no data, in an X query, an X header, that tells you what the, um, the URI is or whether or not um, the URI is, has been expired. Um, so that's LC. But there are other queries that actually use Sparkle. So for example, here in the Getty, there's a Sparkle query, and you'll see that it's embedded in the URI. Um, that's somewhat problematic. So um, the way to encode and decode um, URLs varies different between um, different uh, versions of um, uh, programming languages. They shouldn't, but they do. Um, and so, um, there are times where you may use something that encodes a, uh, a query um, that can't be read well um, within uh, the way MarkEdit handles um, URL encoding, which uses the .NET uh, toolset. Um, I have a feeling that this need to create actual encoded URLs um, makes defining your own Sparkle queries um, somewhat problematic for most folks. And so I started thinking about how um, I could make this easier so that folks could manage their own databases, uh, collections within the tool. Um, the other reason for the, the thinking about the change is I'm allowing the ability to have local um, Sparkle endpoints using um, an RDF data dump. So for example, uh, let's say you had the uh, children's subject headings um, as an RDF data dump or you had the RDF um, registry as an RDF data dump. MarkEdit can have, you can point MarkEdit at that RDF file, and prior to running the reconciliation step, it'll load those, those RDF data files into a part of the application, which creates a, a triple store. Um, that will index all of the triples and create a fully functioning Sparkle query for that data dump, which means that for reconciliation purposes, there's a penalty in terms of loading that data up front. But once that data is loaded, the queries happen almost instantaneously. So if you have a large data set that needs to query one of these resources over and over and over again, um, uh, it makes a lot of sense to do that locally. Um, and should speed up the process because you're not having to query remote, uh, remote resources. Um, so um, that requires a change. Um, and so what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be creating a new variable in the uh, collections definition, which is actually going to be Sparkle query. And so rather than having this URI, for example, here, 
which has both the, the base and the, uh, the URI behind it, there'll be the URI which basically takes you up to the question mark. And if you're using um, a Sparkle query, the assumption will be that um, because of the syntax of the way Sparkle works, that the, 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 um, the variable to be used will be query equals, and then Mark Edit will allow you to encode the Sparkle query yourself. Um, you'll still be able to add additional data. So let's say you wanted to provide um, something around like inference. And so like in mesh, that requires an extra variable. Um, that can be included as part of the URI. Uh, basically, um, the Sparkle query will be part of uh, its own piece that MarkEdit will attach when it makes the query. Um, but it'll also then allow you to do local queries because it'll be able to be embedded. And then within the XML, it'll be much easier to read because you'll have a URI and then you'll have the, the query itself. So it should be a little easier to, to edit in the XML, um, but I'm gonna try and make it so you don't have to. Um, so that's collections. So the rules um, tell MarkEdit how to process a specific field. So here's a 100 field. In Mark 21, there are some very specific um, assumptions that get made when you, you when you code a 100 field. One is that they're, they're, those, those 100s represent personal names um, but the other assumption that's made, and this is this is unfortunate, is that that data all comes out of the uh, LC name authority file. Um, I, the reason I say that's un unfortunate is because most of the other fields that use control vocabularies also have um, a subfield in the record that identifies the terms, uh, the the vocabulary that those terms come from. Um, so that way, if you use uh, terms from multiple vocabularies, you can recognize those. So think about um, the way that we do subject headings. Um, we use either the indicator two um, or we use the subfield two to delineate which um, control vocabulary is being utilized to create those subjects. Um, unfortunately, in the wild, I see a lot of people using doing the same thing in the 100 field, but there's no value to identify where the control vocabulary came from. Um, and so in the rules file, we try to accommodate for that. So the rules file tells me that in for the 100 field, we only process on bibliographic records. Um, we can process, we can tell MarkEdit to either process on authority records only, on bibliographic records only, or on both types. Um, the tag that's being looked at, so the 100 field, the subfields that are going to be used for reconciliation, um, this is the global URI subfield that'll be generated, so subfield zero. So whatever process happens, it'll generate a zero, but we can override that, and we will in the instructions. Um, if there are any special processing instructions, so we know that the 100 field in this case is used for personal names, so we're going to tell it it's personal name. Um, and then this right here is how MarkEdit knows um, which vocabulary to use when there's no um, vocabulary um, statement that's identified in the subfield. So in the 100 field, there isn't one. So you could define this two different ways. You could create an element that looks like this, vocab equals NAF. And what that does is that tells MarkEdit that the, it should use um, the name authority file for reconciliation purposes and that the result that it gets will get put into um, the data that's stored in the URI value here, which means it's going to go into a subfield zero. Um, I actually like to define specifically for um, clarity's sake where the data that's reconciled using this vocabulary goes. So there's an additional value here that subfield equals zero. So this overrides the global value and tells uh, Mark Edit that for the purposes of this reconciliation, when it does, when it looks up data from the NAF, it goes into the subfield zero. And there's a second call here that tells Mark Edit to also look this data up in B auth, and if it's found, put it in the subfield one. So in theory, if a user was mixing um, vocabularies in the 100 field, let's say we were using the name authority file and the Getty's um, uh, a vocabulary from the Getty, or, or maybe we were using an, a different vocabulary, a local vocabulary, we could create a statement that also said um, vocab, so we, we, let's say we had a local one, we could do something like this, 
and have this be our local vocab. And as long as it was defined in the collections list, mark edit would look both in the name authority file, um, LC name authority file, and our local vocab file. So I could actually have it do multiple lookups. Um, all right. So that's been accommodated in the XML file. Uh, and, and for me, um, this is how I prefer to work with the data set. But I realize that this makes it a challenge for other folks. And, and as I've been uh, talking to folks and, and thinking about this, um, both from a usability standpoint, but also um, the, the thought of Mark Edit being used as a teaching tool, I wanted to start thinking about how we might be able to make the edits in the rules file more straightforward so that users could edit these fields themselves. And so that's where I've been looking at um, this uh, proof of concept. And there's a pretty good chance this will make its way into Mark Edit 7. Uh, so what this is, is this is an editor. So um, the tool, when it loads, it reads the local uh, rules file and it breaks things down into reconciliation rules. So these are all of the fields that have been defined within the reconciliation rule set. Um, and collection rules, these are all of the collections that are currently defined within the, uh, the rule set. And so I can go ahead, um, we'll go ahead and open this up. I can go ahead and look at that 100 field and that you can see here in the XML file, there's a record, the record type is set for bibliographic. You can see here are the other record types that are available, but for 100, the 100 field, it's set for bibliographic, that the field type is set as 100, that the subfields used for reconciliation purposes show up here. There are no indicator configurations because in this case, the indicator one or indicator two um, give us no information about which uh, control vocabulary should be used for reconciliation purposes. That's different in the uh, subjects, and so we'll look at a subject to see how that's applied. Um, the source term, there isn't one, and this is the problem. There is no source term, so in the 100 field, you'll see no source. The global URI subfield, the zero here is represented here. The always run, so that's where we've, we've defined the data here in these vocab statements. They show up in these always runs. So we've got the name authority file with subfield attached at zero and NAF at one. Those values will show up in these text boxes if I double click on them so that I can edit them. Um, if I want to delete them, I select and right click and I can delete one. Down below, we have the ability to set uh, special instructions. So in this case, personal name processing, but we also have name, which roughly does the same thing as personal names subjects mixed and linking. Well, the linking pretty much should only be used for um, uh, the uh, uh, 880. Um, so we can now edit everything that's in that XML record in the editor. And so we can see some different ways that these things have been defined. So um, music headings are, are super problematic. So let's pick one. So the, 388, the 385. So in this case, we have it where it's going to process against the authority and the bibliographic record. Um, this, the field is the 380. Subfields used for reconciliation are A. Indicators aren't defined, um, aren't, aren't useful for defining which uh, collection gets used. Um, but there is a source term. So the collection, um, the, the, in the, the value that defines which, um, uh, which vocabulary is being used is the subfield 2. So that's recognized here. Um, global indicator value is a zero, um, so we're going to always use the subfield zero when we reconcile against whatever the term is found in the subfield two. So because there's no other instructions that need to be there, because that answers that question, I don't have to create those special vocab statements. So those aren't been those haven't been created in the always run. There's no special instructions in this case, and we um, atomize the field. So in this case, this tells us that. Um, what that means is that in the th if you're familiar with the 385, the 385 has uh, multiple subfield A's, and each subfield A represents a different um, uh, control vocabulary term. And in a linked data context, that's bad. Um, we don't want to create um, a subfield A, and then a subfield 0, and then a subfield A, and then a subfield 0. Um, because then proximity within the mark field um, has too much value. 
And so rather than doing that, we use this atomize fields, which will break and create new fields, new 385s, every time it encounters a subfield A. And so it'll take that subfield A, generate a subfield zero, and then create a second subfield A and another subfield zero in a different field if there are multiple elements. And in fact, sometimes, and again, these are musics, the music that are problematic, we have data that needs to be sticky. And so that's what these sticky subfields are. So a subfield N in the 386 can be used once, but be used to um, represent information found on multiple subfield A's. And so using this sticky bit, it tells MarkEdit that that subfield N, when I create multiple fields using the, the different subfield A's for reconciliation, that N needs to go with it. So that way it'll pair those two together. So there are ways to do some complicated um, uh, breaks in here as well. Um, if we look at the subjects, so like the 650, we see it's done for bibliographic. We see that the field is the 650, the subfields that are used, but we also see here the indicators. So in this case, indicators mean something. So um, we see here that uh, indicator two, so the first value is the indicator, indicator two, um, the value is zero, um, that maps to LCSH. And so that would go into the collection. So if I double clicked on that, that would show me all that there. If I right clicked on it, I could delete it or I could add new ones. And so in this case, um, if we go to um, the seven, we see that the indicator two, um, if it's a, a, a seven, then that's the value. And there's no um, value that's defined when it's a indicator two subfield seven, because that value actually gets defined here in subfield two. So Mark Edit has ways to, to accommodate the different ways that Mark um, uh, tells you that it should um, uh, find uh, preference. And so again, we can look through here, we see that the special instructions are subject, there's no always run because that information gets defined either in an indicator or in a subfield two. Um, and so I can um, go through and, and edit these values or add new fields um, to the process and not have to deal with the XML uh, file. Um, in the collection rules, we get the same kind of thing. So um, if we look at the German National Library, the German National Library is a special case um, to some degree. In all of the, the German National Library, as far as I'm aware, doesn't have a Sparkle endpoint. Um, but the um, examples in MARC records that I see, um, what they did actually was in the subfield zero, um, they've included a, um, uh, a value that basically is their control number. And so in order to turn that into a URI, um, we can use this pattern. And so this pattern, URI pattern, tells Mark Edit, okay, when you run across in the subfield to GND, what you're actually going to do is you're not going to look anything up because reconciliation is, it'll, it'll, reconciliation has happened. Um, go ahead and take the number, the control number found in the subfield zero and turn it into a URI. Um, for the, the uh, Getty Arts, we can see there's the ATA, uh, the URI, the Sparkle query that gets used for the search. Um, and then there would be a JSON path, which um, looks like I, I'm not selecting the right value here, but um, it's a, a binding that I'll make sure shows up there. So um, we can do our edits for uh, LC, where it's just a URL. We can see that we just get the, the, the term, uh, the URI, and that's it. And these ones are kind of um, anything that doesn't use a Sparkle query. These are our collections that um, I'm having to set up in MarkEdit specifically. So uh, MarkEdit's been defined, designed so that as long as the endpoint is a Sparkle endpoint, um, users have the ability to add their own um, defined collections. Uh, so a local collection that's been added um, in my example is the, let's see here, where is it? Uh, oh, I don't have it in this file. Um, would be the, um, you could create a local, local heading um, that you mapped your concept term to if you wanted to, um, that then you could use later. Uh, but it has to be 
it has to be a uh, sparkle endpoint um, in order for Mark Edit to know uh, how to use that because you'll provide um, a JSON path that will tell Mark Edit how to read the data going forward. Um, so this interface will probably make its way um, into Mark Edit 7. I'm going to clean it up a little bit. I'm going to work a little bit more with it because there's some stuff that I'd like to clean up. Obviously, you could see that the, the, the JSON binding didn't pa pass over. Um, I need to make sure that the XML files that are created um, are, are still compatible with Mark Edit 6 um, so that everything still works. Um, but I'm thinking that long term, um, rather than forcing everybody into editing the XML file directly, um, which I will admit is, will still probably be the way that I work with it, um, that there will be a, a graphical interface um, that users can use to edit the data. Um, what this also means is that I'll probably be creating some kind of um, help file to help define um, how you would configure um, each one of these individual values um, since uh, the tool, um, uh, because of the way the tool has to, um, because the tool doesn't make assumptions. So for example, if I, if I just assumed all the data in the Mark 100 field was Mark 21, I wouldn't have to do a bunch of other things. But I don't, um, because I do have a rules file for, for Unimark, and in that case, the 100 field means something very different. In fact, you wouldn't use it for reconciliation, I don't believe, if I remember my rules file. So um, the, the, the reason why some of these values, which, um, which make the, the definition uh, a little bit more confusing exist, are because MarkEdit um, is providing uh, the ability to create reconciliation rules across multiple flavors of Mark. Um, and that means that there are a number of assumptions that I can't make um, that, that we just natively make um, when we're working with Mark 21. Uh, but anyways, this is kind of what I'm thinking. Uh, I think this will work better. I'll, I'm probably going to shift this into um, one of the beta builds and, and, and talk to a few folks that I know are working with the uh, the linked data tools to see if they, they think this might be a little bit easier. But I wanted to put this out here too um, so if there are folks who are particularly interested in how MarkEdit is doing the reconciliation work and managing the rules file um, and, and want to be able to have a better understanding of how that process works, they can see kind of the direction that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of thinking right now in terms of being able to support um, an easier way for users to, to manage um, this rules file themselves so it doesn't drop you just directly into an XML file and kind of um, forces you to to read the uh, um, the the notes that are in the top of the XML file and kind of figure it out for yourself so so hopefully this makes sense and this will be a little bit easier um, to process long term uh, if you have questions as always just let me know